Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 21 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. I'm joined today by Eric Desenhall. Eric is the CEO and co-founder of Desenhall Resources and has worked for more than 30 years in crisis management and damage control. He's also the author of 11 books. Today, we're talking about one of those 11 books called Best of Enemies, The Last Great Spy Story of the Cold War. This is the story of an incredible friendship that transpired between a CIA case officer and his target, a KGB agent working under diplomatic cover in the Soviet embassy in Washington, DC. The two men formed an unlikely friendship against all odds, a friendship with some incredible consequences for both men as the animosity of their two respective countries worked against them. Eric, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Thank you. Thank you. I've been looking forward to it. Great. Well, Best of Enemies is an amazing book, and I could barely put it down, honestly. It also seems like a big departure from some of your previous works from what I saw. So can you tell us what is it that inspired you to document this story? Well, I can't take a, a total credit for being inspired. I have a co-author, Gus Russo. I'll give you the quick version. I'm based in Washington and um, Jack Platt and Gennady were in this area and they are friendly with, of all people, Robert De Niro, who they worked with on his film called The Good Shepherd. And they wanted to tell their story. And Gus got involved. Uh, Gus had known Robert De Niro. Uh, Gus had co-authored a book with Henry Hill, who was one of the characters in Goodfellas. And of course, uh, Robert De Niro was in that. I had written a book about Meyer Lansky, and Meyer Lansky was a character called Hyman Roth in The Godfather Part Two. Robert De Niro was in Robert uh, was in Godfather Part Two, and so had some interest in what I had written there. He brought us all together, and we started this process of doing groundwork for the book. But it, to be honest, it took a couple of years to figure out what the book was going to be about because. Jack and Gennady, Jack was the CIA guy, Gennady, KGB, they became, they were, uh, they were supposed to turn each other at the height of the Cold War. And rather than doing that, they ended up becoming best friends. And while that's all very adorable, that's an article, that's not a book. So it took us a couple years uh, to find out what the book was going to be, and I'm happy to tell you, if you're interested, the moment when we realized we had a book. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Please do. Well, you know, we were talking to Jack and Gennady and meeting with them at different places, and certainly they're fascinating guys. I mean, uh, if they ever make a movie about this, you're not going to believe the reality of Jack and Gennady is crazier than anything that you would see in a movie. People wouldn't believe people like this exist. In any event, Gus and I are at a uh, restaurant with a bunch of spies and some of them see our frustration because we're trying to see what the story is beyond this unusual friendship. And one of the spies, not Jack or Gennady, leans forward and says, Hanson. And yeah, okay, we know Hanson, the worst spy, arguably in American history, the FBI agent. And this spy says, they got him. And Gus and I said, well, we know the story of Hanson. And the spy said, no, you don't. You know the movie, you know the books. You don't know that these were the guys. And Gus and I looked at each other and suddenly the world began to make sense because Gennady had been in prison in uh, the Russian, basically the Russian gulag for five years based on his friendship with Jack. And okay, we understand how they might imprison somebody for their relationship with a CIA officer, but 
it didn't tell the whole story. When we heard that Hansen was a big, ultimately a target, that made sense because the Russians lost their great asset and they were not happy about it and they wanted to punish somebody and they thought wrongly that Gennady played a double agent kind of role in that process. And then we knew we had a book because the takedown of Robert Hansen as the coda to this story really explained a lot. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I loved was at the very beginning, you had this cast of characters written at the, the beginning to keep everybody straight. And having read so much about the Cold War over the past couple of years, I just saw so many names that I recognized from so many different stories and so many impactful moments and all that. And they're all tied into one book in a way that I was not expecting at all when I picked it up. But it really, you know, these guys branching connections and all the people that they touched on, it's it's really the whole story of the Cold War condensed into one book, which I found amazing for sure. And I love the Hanson connection as well, because just coincidentally, um, I was driving through Vienna a few days ago and I walked oh. through uh, Foxstone Park and walked across that footbridge where he was eventually um, caught doing his dead drops. Uh, that was just a couple of days ago. So it's great to talk about him now. Uh, yeah, he Hansen was a very interesting guy. And, you know, what was interesting is not only did Jack and Gennady at the beginning of their friendship had no idea that this would become a part of their lives. Um, what was interesting to us is that um, the Russians didn't even know who Hansen was individually. And they didn't know Hansen. And so there were a lot of, uh, there was a series of accidents uh, combined with calculation. And one of the reasons these guys became friends was they wanted to turn each other. And that did not happen. But other things did happen, uh, both by calculation and by accident. And Jack was playing a very long game that ultimately benefited him in the takedown of Hansen. But he didn't go into this in the late 1970s having any idea that this would be a dividend of this friendship. So there was a lot of improvisation. Oh, I'm sure who could have imagined. So we're already talking at this moment about how these two guys come to be pitted against each other in the DC area. Can you take us back and kind of, kind of show us how their careers led them to that moment? Like who was Jack? What brought him into the CIA? Who was Gennady? How did he wind up undercover in DC? Well, the simple version, Jack was, uh, his nickname was Cowboy. He's a gruff Marine. Uh, he had been outside of Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis, ready to come ashore. Uh, and lost a finger in a grenade explosion, in a grenade test explosion. Real character. And even though he was a brilliant guy, he was not a schmoozy CIA type. Um, you know, you're supposed to go in your office in jacket and tie. He would show up in jeans and wearing a vest and wearing Western boots and had just no interest in playing by the rules, which was an unusual type of thing. And he was stationed all over the world, Laos, Paris, in the 1970s. And he hears about this new guy, this Russian coming to town to work at the embassy named Gennady Vasilenko. And they met at a Harlem Globetrotters game at the Capitol Center uh, outside of Washington. They, of course, lied to each other and they used their legend or fake name. Jack introduced himself as Chris Lorenz. I don't remember Gennady's name that, that, that he used, but Gennady brought his six-year-old son and they're sitting at the Harlem Globetrotters game. And, you know, Jack is trying to figure out a way into this guy uh, because so your listeners understand this. I mean, the Cold War was all about nukes and trying to find information about who was going to strike first. Uh, that was, even though we later learned that nobody really had any interest in the first strike, there was a long time in history where people believed that was true. Gennady's father-in-law was the godfather of the Russian hydrogen bomb. Um, so they thought he was a good target. And so they're, they're at this basketball game, this Harlem Globetrotters basketball game, and Jack says something about one of the players shooting. And Gennady, whose English wasn't great, heard, oh, shooting, you know, like a, a gun. And Jack deduced from that that Gennady was very interested in guns. And so began the, 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 
the bonding of their friendship. They started to go out shooting because Gennady did not have access, even being in the KGB, to all of the cool Western guns that Jack did. And so that's what they bonded over. Over firearms. That <laughs> sounds like two real guys for sure, just shooting it out and getting to know each other better. So this was, I'm sure this was a very delicate operation, but at the same time, Gennady knew exactly what was going on from the beginning. I, I take it, right? When he's, you know, bumps into this guy who's willing to take him out and meet him further. And, you know, uh, there's, there's no such thing as coincidences in that world. I'm guessing. So how did Gennady handle it? No, I think, I think that you said it correctly. And they knew they were playing each other and they started the seduction process. And there was a point where Jack said, look, what do you have to offer me? You know, a, a 10 by 10 apartment in Moscow in the, in, in the winter? Come on. And Gennady said, well, I'm not, I'm not turning either. But, you know, both of these guys were shrewd. And the thing about the spy world is you never know what leads to what. And Gennady was very attracted to the American lifestyle. You know, as gruff and curmudgeonly as Jack was, Gennady, uh, if you look at the photos in the book, very, very good looking guy. He liked the ladies despite being married. He liked sports. And one of the first things he began to do was try to meet people in Washington. Uh, he joined volleyball leagues and he would go into the Department of the Interior and other places and begin to get lists of employees of the U.S. cabinet departments by trying to, by, you know, grabbing the lists of people on these teams. So he started to get to know people on the U.S. side in Washington in that way. And he's a lovable guy. I mean, he, you know, he, he's, he's fun to be with. And he was really into the American lifestyle. And while he wasn't about to turn, he certainly had a blast in hanging out in the U.S. And Jack thought that that would come in handy someday. And as it turns out, he was right. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was amazing to me. Gennady is, is nothing like what you would expect a Russian to be. It seems like he's playing pranks on his bosses at the embassy and they can't stand it and they never give in to it. And he's, you know, obviously takes immediately to this American life and he's making friends with CIA people and reporting it correctly. But it just seems like he's an incorrigible kind of guy for sure, just like Jack was. So I guess that was part of their attraction. Well, yeah, there's one scene where Jack thinks, well, maybe he has got this guy cold because they encounter Gennady in the back of a station wagon with a an American, high-ranking American military officer's daughter. Oh boy. And rather than getting out of the car and looking mortified that he had been busted, he's like, hey, you know, meet Sheila <laughs> or whatever her name <laughs> was. He didn't care. And the recklessness, I mean, First of all, if ever you believe that all Russians are the Russians of James Bond movies, these door characters who have no humor and only spout Marxist rhetoric, I mean, you know, Gennady was one of the Beach Boys, basically. And furthermore, if ever you're under the impression that people in the spy world are all these ninjas who tiptoe through the night, never caught, these guys were crazy. And Jack was an alcoholic. Got himself in trouble a lot. In fact, he, he faced existential career trouble that he ultimately overcame with, with his alcoholism. But, you know, the people who go into this line of work, I mean, I've written a lot about organized crime and a lot about spies. And one of the things that always surprises people is when I tell them that some of the biggest whiners I've ever met are mafia killers and some of the most indiscreet people I've ever met or spies. And so the question becomes, that makes no sense. How could that be? Hmm. Well, okay, on the gangster side, look at what they do. These are antisocial personalities who break the law for a living. When you break the law for a living, there really are people out to kill you and put you into jail. You really are under siege. When you are under siege, it's a lot of pressure. And when you are under constant pressure, you complain a lot. And so contrary to the idea that, you know, gangsters, there's these tough guys, they feel very besieged, even though it's their own fault. Now on the spy side, you know, who becomes a spy? And even though I'm making a gross oversimplification, in that generation, you had a lot of people who were wild men. 
They were hard drinkers. They wanted adventure around the world. And so discretion doesn't always go hand in hand with that. Right, right. Absolutely. And it's amazing how both of these guys, their indiscretions just kind of complemented each other in a way that really cemented this friendship through thick and thin. So can you tell me a little bit about how after this first meeting, I guess they go to the shooting range together. How does this relationship proceed, especially when it's clear that, you know, neither guy is going to flip to the other side? Well, there a lot of it was, you know, passive seductions. There was a point where, uh, you know, Jack handed over a briefcase full of cash that said there's more where that came from. And Gennady said, no, cut this out. Can we just agree that we're going to, to be friends? I don't want your money and I'm not going to give up any information. And, you know, being spies, nobody listens. And, you know, a month later you show up uh, with a bigger briefcase. And, you know, this went on for years and years. And Jack gave Gennady gifts. And of course, the KGB knew about this and was ticked off. And, you, you know, you can't do this. But they also misinterpreted it. And this led to a very, very scary incident in about 1986, where Gennady is called to Havana to a meeting. You know, he had been friends with Jack for a little under a decade. And he goes into, into this hotel room and he's jumped from behind, uh, beaten up and put on this freighter back to Russia. They think Gennady has turned because they're losing some of their assets. The Russians are losing some of their assets and they don't know how this is happening. And they figured they've got the guy, they've, it's Gennady. So they take him to Lefortovo prison, which was an interesting place where <laughs> a terrible place where there are these little divots in the wall where every day Gennady is taken out. And at some point, somebody steps out behind from one of the divots as he walks down the hall and points a gun at his head and click. There's, you know, there, there, there's no bullet in there. And they think this form of torture will get him to talk. Well, after six months, they realized something interesting. This guy has not turned, hmm. that they're operating on a theory. And the other thing is Gennady is very well liked in the KGB and his father-in-law was a powerful guy. They don't have him, but, but they also resented his, his behavior, his fl flouting of his relationship with Jack. And look, you know, Gennady was also... A character. I mean, he was asked to go undercover and he walks into his office, uh, into the, the consulate uh, in Washington one day, dressed in full military regalia. And he said, uh, OK, I'm ready to go uh, 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 undercover. And his boss says, look at you, you know, you're dressed like a decorated Russian army general. And Gennady says, oh, so you don't think that this is subtle enough for me to infiltrate? And they're going... You, why are you acting like this? And Gennady pretends he doesn't understand. I mean, this is this is the kind of behavior you're dealing <laughs> with, which is, you know, which is hilarious. And so the combination of these things, they just figure they're going to bounce him and they fire him from uh, the CIA. And this year, 1986, is important because it's known as the year of the spy. The, the, some of the Russians who uh, they have turned have gone up missing, including two of Gennady's friends, Martinov and Motorin, from the Washington uh, Residentura, the, the, the KGB headquarters. And so the Russians are losing spies, Americans are losing spies, and they know they have a problem and they're grasping and they think they've got Gennady. It turns out they're wrong, but we will be revisiting this aspect of the story later when we do know who it was. Sure. Sure. So as you mentioned, these guys were friends for many years. And of course, they didn't just stay there in their, you know, temporary postings in Washington, D.C. together. So how did they stay? How did they maintain this friendship as they moved around the world? Well, they went into business together, providing security and investigations. And, you know, Russia, as we know it, I mean, the Soviet Union, as we know it, breaks apart in the early 1990s. This is very convenient because people don't know what's going on in the world and they need people who are familiar 
with that part of the world to consult with. And that's what they did. And that's one of the ways they ended up meeting Robert De Niro to consult with him on The Good Shepherd. In fact, they thought that Gennady would play the Russian KGB big shot Ulysses in the film, but Gennady was once again in 2002 kidnapped by the Russians, arrested, and spent five years in prison. But they, but they did during the period of from the late 1980s to the early 2000s, they, they were business partners. And that was a very convenient time because Jack, at being ever loyal to the CIA and wanting to find out who the mole was, Jack was asked after Gennady was ultimately freed from the Russian prison system. I'll fast forward. Gennady was exchanged in the famous 2005 spy swap. Jack was asked, is using a friend really what to get information, what true friends do? And Jack said, no, but it's what good intelligence officers <laughs> do. That's right. And even though he didn't know at the outset what would happen, his friendship with Gennady ultimately paid off. That's right. That's right. That was, it was really incredible. Just closer to the book for sure. Him coming back to, or I should say, yeah, coming back to the United States for good. Finally, uh, I want to go back up though. This this Robert De Niro interaction is really incredible. Can you tell us a little bit more about Robert De Niro's impact on their relationship? Because that was to me just totally out of left field when I first read that. Well, it's one of those things that you that you can't make up, and he played a big role in catalyzing this book, and has been an absolute gentlemen through the whole process because you know among the roles that de niro played was saving gennady's life when he was imprisoned from you know 2005 to 2010. so one of the things that happened when gennady was in russia po and by the way i may have incorrectly said the spy swap was 2005 i forget but it was 2010 Gennady was taken down in 2005 by the Russians. But so Gennady's in prison. He's in a bunch of different prisons. He's being beaten. He's being tortured. He's being woken up in the middle of the night and moved. And Jack is desperately trying to save Gennady's life. And they find out what prison he's in. And Robert De Niro sends uh, a Christmas card to a popular Russian movie director who gets it to the prison. And Gennady uh, in the prison system, not unlike what happens in the US, although it's much worse over there, there is a major gangster who kind of runs the prison. And they're all trying to figure out what, what to do with this Gennady guy. One day, this big gangster, Slava, sees that Gennady has this Christmas card from Robert De Niro, where there's a photo of the two of them together. And, you know, gangsters are just as starstruck as anybody else. And Gennady thinks these Russian gangsters are going to hurt him. And the guy says, you know Robert De Niro? <laughs> and Gennady says, yeah, he, he's a friend of mine. You know Robert De Niro? Oh, this is, this is good. And, they, then they, and, and Gennady then fell under their protection because these killers were all starstruck that Gennady knew Robert De Niro. So he ended up, you know, kind of playing a role in, in saving his life when he spent uh, a little over five years being beaten and tortured in a variety of, of, these, the, of these prisons. That's amazing. And it's also something that it didn't come out. This occurred in, what, 2007 or so? So it didn't become known for, what, 10 years, I guess, until your book came out? Is that right? I mean... Uh, yeah, I, I, about about that. You know, Gennady was, uh, I mean, Hansen was taken down in 2002, I believe. Gennady was captured in Russia in 2005, released in the spy swap in 2010. So we tell the story of what happened to Gennady in prison. And basically, to, to keep things simple, once Hansen was taken down. I mean, the Russians lost a very valuable asset and it took a little while to get their act together, but they once again concluded it was Gennady who gave up Hansen. They weren't right and they weren't totally wrong. Gennady did not, was not a CIA mole. He was not a, he was not a spy for the CIA. However, 
when he was in business with Jack, one of the things Gennady did do was he facilitated travel for former KGB people who wanted to do business in the United States. Jack, shrewdly, after meeting an interesting guy who we call Stepanov, that is not his real name because we were asked by the intelligence community not to use it. Stepanov, KGB guy who was friends with Gennady, one day cornered Jack and said, if somebody theoretically happened to know who the mole was, theoretically, if that person theoretically were to talk to the American authorities about who that might be, what would be in it for him? And this began the long dance that led to the selling of Robert Hansen. And this character, Stepanov, what he essentially did is when Russia and the Soviet Union was melting down, he took himself, Mr. Stepanov, a little package outside of KGB headquarters. And it was a box of files. And among the things that was in those files was an audio tape. And that audio tape had the voice of none other than Robert Hansen on it. And Stepanov was seduced by the American authorities, the FBI in particular. And remember, they thought for a while they had gotten the mole because in 1994, Aldridge Ames was taken down. And once and for all, they figured that's who gave up Gennady and all of these spies in 1986. The problem Jack and others realized is Alter James was stationed in Rome and would not have been in the pipeline that would have known the particular information that Gennady had this friendship with Jack. So they began to realize it was someone else. In any event, this Stepanov character takes the, these files and years later, 2002, sells them to the FBI for about $7 million. And one day the FBI is sitting in one of their secure briefing areas and they listen to this audio tape. And you'll probably recall, they only know Robert Hansen as this character called Ramon. They don't, nobody knows he is Robert Hansen. And one day they're, they're listening to this audio tape of the mole and they hear his voice and they hear a phrase. It's a little off color, but you can edit it if it's inappropriate. He refers to somebody as these purple pissing SOBs and they go, oh my God, it's Bob Hansen. And the vanity of both the FBI and the CIA is the CIA that thought, well, it's not our people. And the FBI thought, well, there's no way it's our people. But it turns out they had they had been looking mostly at the CIA rather than at the FBI. And it turned out the mole was was in the FBI. And that is how they rolled up Hansen. Right, right. That's that's so incredible to me that this recording was in, I guess, Stepanov's apartment or closet or storage building or whatever for, I guess, 10 years or something like that. Meanwhile, he was continuing to do damage over time before Stepanov finally found someone who could put him in contact with CIA people and, and figure out a way to leverage this recording that he had into a new life. And well, that's right. And, you know, Jack didn't really like the guy. You know, he thought he was a pain in the neck. But Jack, um, despite his gruff demeanor, was shrewd. And, you know, he thought that, that Stepanov was just looking for a business opportunity. And one of my favorite parts with Gus of writing this book was this seduction involving... Stepanov coming to America on the auspices of selling Russian sculptures and art and Russian toys, you know, those, the, those Russian dolls. And, and, and they, they, they hook Jack up with oh, this right. flamboyantly gay art dealer in New York. And Jack is, you know, he's, he's an old school guy. He's like, what am I doing with these, you know, artsy fartsy people, <laughs> but he had, but he's playing mm -hmm. a long game and he thinks maybe the Stepanov guy, you know, we don't know if he has something. And look, I mean, as you know, the problem in the world of spies and organized crime is you're dealing with a lot of characters who make pretend they know how everything went down. I mean, I have, I haven't met many mobsters who, if you ask them who killed Julius Caesar, 
you know, they'll go, hey, let me tell you how that went down. You know, it was it wasn't it wasn't Brutus and Cassius. It was my friend Johnny Bag of Donuts, you know, <laughs> and in the spy world, it's the same thing. You know, you ask a spy what happened oh, to Trotsky, even if they were born 50 years later, you know, they know. <laughs> and so you have to navigate around this huge mountain of BS. But it turned out in this case, of all things, this guy really did walk out of KGB headquarters, scared to death of how he was going to make a living, and he took files. Hmm. Incredible. That's incredible stuff for sure. Otherwise, he may never have been caught, I guess, because he was very careful for the most part. He was. I mean, you know, what's interesting is a lot of these guys aren't as careful as you think. With Aldra James, a lot of what caught him is you know, he was in a carpool, and one of the people in the carpool noticed, well, he's got a Jaguar. He's got these, the, the, the carpool person knew a lot about interior design, and he had these very expensive drapes all of a sudden. Ames all, also got his teeth capped and started acting like a smoothie, <laughs> a smooth operator, and that was red flags. Uh, you know, Hansen uh, also had his side of recklessness with the, with the stripper right. and everything, right. but that's not what got him. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what got him was, were the tapes. Yeah. So was that a taped, like a phone conversation or something? Okay. Yes. I've always wondered about that. I've never heard the recording or anything. So I... No, no, no. I would love to tell you that I did, but I haven't. But I think that I can't translate what was actually on the audio tape other than to tell you it was unequivocally Hanson's voice. And it caused, right, right. you know, the, the, for years, the suspicion was on a CIA person named Kelly who who ended up dying. I mean, you know, who knows how much was stress related, but to their credit, I mean, the people at the FBI admitted that they didn't arrest him, but they had the wrong guy under suspicion because he was in that pipeline. And I think one of the, where vanity plays into it is we all like to think, well, I can't be fooled. It's certainly not one of my people because I'm a shrewd operator. I can spot it from a mile away and look, maybe right. you can't. Um, right. And Hanson was, you know, he was, even though he was an odd guy, he was not as disliked. I mean, he was thought of uh, by a number of people, despite his peculiarities as a mentor. And, you know, one of the questions that Gus and I asked ourselves, <clears throat> and we debated this, is what makes a person become a traitor? And it's not the answer we went into it expecting. We thought we knew what we were talking about, but I, I learned something very different. And so did Gus from about what motivates people. And most people get it wrong, I think. So what was your takeaway? Resentment. You know, there, there are a variety of, re of factors that cause it. Most people think it's all about money and money is, you know, it's a part of it. But I think with Hanson, you have a guy who thought, I'm smarter than my, bo my boss. I'm smarter than the people I work with. I'm smarter than everybody I know. The world has not recognized my greatness. How dare they? So you know what I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. Screw them. I'm going to smile at their faces and I'm going to rob them blind. That's what they get for not recognizing mm -hmm. my singular greatness. And I'll, so then the question becomes, where does that particular type of ego come from. And I think that it comes from humiliation. I mean, Hansen was constantly humiliated by his cop father. And one way I think the human brain responds to humiliation is developing a fantasy life. And part of that fantasy life is, mm -hmm. is I am great and uniquely destined for greatness. And so here he is still a bureaucrat. And the world is not acknowledging his greatness. When that intersects with midlife and sex and money, you've got yourself a problem. But it wasn't just money. I, I have come to believe that resentment, humiliation-driven resentment, is what moves the world. And I, I think that that was a big role with, uh, with Hanson and on eventually on Jack's birthday in 2002, they didn't want Jack to know they had him because they were afraid Jack was going to kill him. I mean, we, you know, Gus and I talked oh, to Jack, uh, you know, were you going to kill him if you knew who he was? And he said, 
I don't know what I would have done, but uh, yeah, he did say he would have had to hire somebody to start his car. <laughs> so one day Jack is on the bus on his birthday in 2002, and they, they get a call from somebody at the FBI that says, happy birthday, watch the news tonight. Hmm. And that was the night of Hanson's, well, the press release, I guess, that Hanson had been arrested, right? It was the night of that Hanson was taken down. But a lot of what we deal with in Best of Enemies is the tortuous efforts to get Gennady out of Russia. You know, I told you the story of Robert De Niro. Another one of my other favorite stories from the book is that there was an effort uh, in Washington by a group known as the Schaffler Brunch Group, which was is a, is a brunch group of reporters of of law enforcement people, of CIA people, including our friend Dan Moldea, who played a role in trying to get, find people in Russia to, who could help get Gennady out. And one of the quotes we have in the book is, it is the job of the CIA to break the laws of the countries in which it operates. And so one of the efforts was to bribe people in Russia. And so they go to, and, and you know, for those listening, I'm grossly oversimplifying this. They go to an American mobster who's going to go to a Russian mobster and the, give the Russian mobster money. And the Russian mobster will bribe the Russian officials. Long story short, Gennady's son delivers the money to the Russian mobster and the, and the mobster does what Russians do. He takes the money and he doesn't help. <laughs> And so, you know, I, Gus and I said to Jack, well, what did you do? Uh, these Russian mobsters, these are tough guys. And Jack said, uh, yeah, you know, they are tough guys, but my guys won two world wars, print their own money and, and have nuclear weapons. <laughs> and we, Jack wouldn't tell us what they did to the guy who took their money, but he put us in touch with, we'll just call him a guy from New York. Who, who told Gus and I what they did to the guy, <clears throat> provided that we didn't tell it uh, while he was alive. All I can tell you is Gus and I were quite impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. I look forward to that story one day as well. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Gennady is, is just suffering away for five years and his, his quality of life is improved by this Christmas card from Robert De Niro, like you mentioned. But how exactly did he end up in this spy swap? Like what all led to him being put on a plane and coming to the United States in 2010? Well, there were a lot of machinations. I mean, first of all, this group, uh, a lot of your listeners probably watched the TV show, The Americans, which is great. And that was loosely based on a group of people called the illegals. And the only difference is, you know, in the Americans, they're running around chopping people up and putting them in suitcases and stealing nuclear secrets. Uh, the reality of the illegals is they weren't really very active in America. They were sleepers, but it's much more sexy to have them, you know, stealing nuclear secrets. And when they were, they were caught and that began the process of trying to figure out how we exchange spies because there were other Russians that had been caught uh, and who were of value, including ones that probably played a role in the Alder James takedown. There were people like Gennady. And so these negotiations began. And one day Jack is told, I know we, I'm sorry we couldn't tell you sooner, but your friend is on the list. Uh, the illegals were taken down in 2010. And look, one of the things that both sides always fear is, my God, who knows what they know and what they're going to say. And one way to short circuit it is to is to negotiate so that you each get your people out and for reasons only you know about. And so the illegals were exchanged for Gennady and some other valuable people and brought back brought back into the United States. And Gennady has been back ever since. OK, so that's 10. So he's lived his last 10 years or so here in the United States somewhere, I take it. Correct. Is he living under a, under another identity or anything like that? No, uh, he's living under his name. And, you know, we've had a lot of interesting conversations. I mean, one of the things Gus and I said to him is, you know, one of the guys who he was exchanged with was Sergei Skripal. And Sergei Skripal yes, yes. ran into a little incident on a park bench in England. 
where he was poisoned. And so, you know, the natural question we had is, my God, you know, Skripal, are you worried that the Russians are going to do this to you? And Gennady's answer was, it would be highly unusual for the Russians to kill someone on American soil. Not impossible, but unlikely. For some reason, England is quasi within the limits, but on American soil, it's considered unusual. So uh, one day I went to Gennady's house and we bonded over firearms and um, because I wasn't sure how I was, you know, were we going to get along? And I brought him a bunch of guns and we were shooting. And I said, so are you worried? You know, and he had his own guns. I said, are you worried about you have these guns for protection or because you like them? Do you think, you know, Putin's going to send people over to shoot you? And he said, no, 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 they, they wouldn't shoot me. That's not their favorite weapon uh, in the West. And I said, what's their favorite weapon? And he said, the staircase, you fall. And he turned, he, he, he mm-hmm. tapped me on the shoulder and he said, what do you notice about my house? And I turned around, we were in his backyard. I said, it's a ranch house. He goes, there you go. No steps. Hmm. Wow. Always one step ahead. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. That, that, yeah, that's fascinating. And it uh, makes perfect sense. It really, you know, I've read and researched and even written some about Russian vindictive poisonings like Skripal and some of the other ones that they have done, which there are quite a few. And one of the main questions that everybody comes up with is how many more do we not know about? So a high profile guy like Gennady. Um, well, no, I mean, you're, you're asking the right questions. And I think that's always one of the conundrums is what goes on in the world that we don't know about. I mean, it's very fashionable to write books about how horrible the CIA is and they're bungle this and they bungle that. Well, flip the question and ask yourself, what would happen if we didn't have them? And I think that one of the key questions Gus and I were trying to get at is with spies, both Russian and American, is do you feel like you did any good? Because there's a lot of resentment and there is a lot of feeling is of futility because a lot of what they do do is fail. I mean, simply because Jack was able to pull off this Hansen operation, it's not like he pulled off that operation all of the time. He had a very long career and this was his big one. And so the question is, is what value do we have? And you see a tremendous amount of resentment in people of multiple countries in the in the spy world. So I, I think that at the end, they felt a certain fraternity that they were part of a largely futile game where they didn't do as much good as they hoped they would, but they did some good. And, you know, to me, when Gus and I were debating the question of what did we learn here, one of the big questions, after all, this was all about nuclear weapons. I mean, that was the end game. Why didn't we kill each other? And I think what we walked away thinking was one reason we didn't kill each other, meaning the Russians, and the Americans, is we didn't really want to. And it's very different from the war with the Islamist fundamentalists, where there is deep personal hatreds with the cultures. I don't think the Americans and Russians hated each other personally. We hated each other's systems. But what I've seen in the interactions with American and even British and, uh, you know, Cold War era Eastern Bloc people is a strange level of affection and relief that it didn't come to that. And I think that there's a difference between hating somebody's system and hating them. And, you know, one possible takeaway is one benefit from the spy game is getting to know each other as best as possible so you don't want to kill each other. Right. That's that's actually a really good point. Now that you mention it, the better you get to know them, the more you see commonalities and, and the, the hesitance on the other side as well, for sure. Yeah, it's harder to kill and hurt people who you know, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think there is some benefit to that familiarity. And I tend to, you know, one of the things that Jack and his family were worried about when we started on this book is, you know, they didn't know Gus and me. They were worried, is it going to be some sort of hit piece? And I spend my day job in the crisis management business 
and where I see people attacking my clients all the time. And what we said to Jack and his family is, look, we're going to have to tell some uncomfortable truths. We can't avoid Gennady's behavior with women. We can't avoid <laughs> Jack's behavior with alcohol because if we do, it's going to be a puff piece and that is really doesn't have the makings of a good book. We have to talk about the flaws of these people and the flaws of the bureaucracy. But to be honest with you, we like these guys and we did not set out to write a book to talk about how much we didn't like them or how much we didn't like the American intelligence community, why we were willing to discuss flaws. We developed a tremendous amount of respect and affection for these people. And I think I would like to believe that that comes true in the book that, you know, Gus and I are not espionage experts. We were storytellers. I mean, I'm a novelist and we wanted to tell a cool story about really cool people. Well, you've most definitely accomplished that. It's, it's a real page turner. And I hope that a lot more people after listening to this will pick it up as well. Best of enemies, because there's, there's so much more that we have not and cannot cover from the book, but it's such an amazing overview of that entire period. And, you know, just touches on every major player of that, that realm really, which is really fascinating to see for me. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Uh, it was a labor of love for us. We hope it'll find its way onto a screen at some point. And we were really excited that it, that it came out and told stories about people we care about. Jack died a few years ago. Gennady's getting up there and we miss Jack terribly. Gennady you know, misses Jack terribly. And we've grown to feel a lot of affection for both of them and their families. I can imagine. I can imagine. They sound like incredible guys for sure. Uh, one day, maybe I'll get the chance to meet Gennady. That'd be amazing for sure. And you mentioned seeing it on the, the big screen or the small screen. Is there anything in the works right now? Is that something you could even talk about if it was? Well, there have there has been interest and that's probably as far as we can we can go. We have had an option in the past. But we have to see where we, we need to see if we get pregnant again with this. But there are some people interested. Sure. OK, fantastic. I certainly look forward to that uh, opportunity to see that in a different medium as well. That'd be really good. So are, are you working on another book right now? Well, I have a new a novel that just came out called False Light, which is deals with in the aftermath of the Me Too movement, the nature of character assassination. And that's something I spend a lot of time dealing with in my day job. And so I, I wrote a fictionalized account of how things like that play out. And false light is a, is a concept in defamation law that deals with reputational attacks. So I had some fun with that and, and that's out. Hmm. I'll bet. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. It's very relevant to the times as well, for sure. Hope so. <laughs> so is there, a, is there anywhere, do you have like an online uh, profile or um, a social media presence, anything if people want to connect with you? Yes. Uh, my author website is www.desbooks.net. So that's D-E-Z books, desbooks.net. Great. Yeah. I'll tell, I've, I think I've already been on there. Actually, that was one of the ways that I found you and looked up your bio to begin with. Yeah, anyway, I can't say enough good things about Best of Enemies. It's I've read a lot of books over the past year, and this has certainly been one of my favorites. So I hope that anybody listening will pick it up as well. Eric, thank you so much for coming on. This has been really illuminating for sure. And I really appreciate your time. It's always fun for me to talk about. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Travis P. and Hugh P. With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is produced for your universal listening pleasure. Any statements shared during our program are opinions and experiences of our team and guests. If you disagree with any content presented herein, please find another show before submitting nasty grams. This is a positive vibes only platform. If you love our show and want to connect, share your experiences, or know someone who we should interview on future episodes, 
please don't hesitate to get in touch through our website or Instagram. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.